Good evening, gospel revolutionaries around the whole world. Welcome to the bonus room once again for a teaching from here in Clarksville, Tennessee. Yes, that's the queen city, uh, once and for all and forever. So uh, it's a beautiful day here in Clarksville. We hope it's uh, going well where you are. <laughs> uh, they seem to think it's very hot right now um, and, and it's summertime. So uh, we want to get right straight into this. I uh, Earlier, I went back and I read through the 95 Thesis that I published uh, several years ago, uh, basically in celebration and a continuance of what Martin Luther did in 500 years prior to that, had uh, written out 95 Thesis and nailed them to the door of the Catholic Church. And uh, I went through and read Martin Luther's 95 Thesis, and the thing that that emphasized the most, not everything, but their big thing was a declaration of freedom from the Pope and his authority. And uh, a big step, granted, a big step for Christianity. The problem was, when they made that step, they were still Christians. <laughs> and 500 years after that, uh, we were able to, that had been a thousand year of, of uh, Catholicism and then the introduction uh, since 500 years ago of Protestantism. And now here we are 500 years later, we're getting better at this, I guess. And uh, we were able to publish another 95 thesis that covers the gospel and we're hoping that it's not going to be 500 years before somebody publishes another set that will uh, be further insight. Uh, maybe this year, who knows? But I read back through this and I've thought many times and even told friends, you know, I need to go in and, and redo that. But I've read through the 95 and I thought, they're all still that way. There's nothing, there's a couple of things that have changed uh, here and there. I want to show you one thing though that we need to change and we will change them in four of the 95 thesis. And that's in uh, thesis number 42, number 59, number 62, and number 63. I want to show you why. Uh, I know many of you remember when we went into the discovery about the difference between imputed righteousness and being made righteous. Uh, at the time for me and for many of us who had made such a step forward, kind of like detaching ourselves from the Pope, uh, we made such a step forward by teaching imputed righteousness. No, our righteousness is imputed. The problem was, as I started researching that, is that that imputed righteousness was being compared to Abraham's faith, not God's faith. I always tried to say that Abraham was a type and shadow of God, and that was functional, but it wasn't true. Uh, so Abraham got imputed faith, and then what was offered then was just like Abraham, you can also, too, have your uh, have your righteousness imputed by your faith. and uh, But Jesus went a step further. Uh, you know, I remember years ago listening to this really good preacher, and my goodness, could he take one line? And it was about the uh, where uh, Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And, uh, oh, it's R.W. Shambach, who it was. That was my buddy. Uh, me and R.W. were good buddies, and I just loved hanging out around this guy and uh, doing the tent meetings with him, and uh, it was it was quite a uh, a circus under the tent, if you will. <laughs> uh, very kind man. I certainly enjoyed R.W. Shambach. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, R.W. was up teaching. And well, he never taught, he preached. He was a preacher. And he got up and he read the verses where it said that uh, as Jesus was in the garden, it says the disciples got tired and they sat down, but Jesus went a little further. And I'm telling you, the whole tent almost came down 
as R.W. taught the whole principle of Jesus going a little bit further. And if you're going to have what you want by faith, you're going to have to do like Jesus and go a little bit further. Can I get an amen from somebody? <laughs> oh, were we excited. And uh, But we've made progress even since then. I, As I said, I Love my memories of uh, R.W. and many of these people. I love my memories of Norval Hayes. What a fun human being that was to be around. And he did uh, show a lot of interest in me and attempted to help in the way that he thought to be able to help. That doesn't mean that we can't change our minds and we can't move on. So that's what I'm wanting to encourage you guys to do is go back and read this 95 Thesis again because you're going to give, get an assignment today. I've never given out assignments as a teacher uh, of the gospel, but you've got an assignment. And your assignment is to rewrite thesis number 42, number 59, number 62, and number 63. So when we begin to uh, focus then on the difference between imputed righteousness and being made righteous, uh, it, it did make a difference. It shook uh, many people uh, because it was such a commonplace vernacular for us. It was our go-to to explain the difference between this and this. And, uh, but we just simply had driven our stake in the wrong place and the, the stake belonged in another place that was much more secure, much more firm, and much more relevatory of the work of the cross. So uh, what I did as I was getting ready to uh, bring this to you is I thought, well, I want to go back and review some of this. And when I was reviewing, I've learned some things I didn't know even then. So put your seatbelt on. Uh, so the first one is uh, Romans chapter six, verse 18. And it's talking about us being then made free from sin. Uh, you have become the servants of righteousness. And being made free from sin, it's uh, really nothing, a whole lot to share there. It, uh, it means that you've been uh, made free from transgressing the law. Uh, it means that um, you don't have to bear this anymore. You don't have to, uh, sin is not a part of, uh, honestly, it should not be a part of your vocabulary in trying to explain to people what Jesus has done for you. Mm. All right, so uh, there is a difference between uh, freedom and exemption. And uh, when it talks about us being made free from sin, it, uh, it implies that we've been made exempt from sin. There is a difference between forgiveness and exemption. Forgiveness is what you need because sin exists. Forgiveness is not what you need anymore if you have an exemption from sin. So we've been made exempt from sin. It is not a part of the uh, gospel anymore except the fact that, let me restate that, it is very much a part of the gospel, but it's a part of the gospel story that happened at the cross. Uh, forgiveness is not something that we are trying to get uh, people into. Uh, in fact, our goal is to help people know they've been made free from sin. And uh, is that a job? Uh-huh, you do know that. That's quite a job. Uh, so the issue of being made free from sin is the difference between forgiveness and exemption. And uh, man, I tell you, I am so glad that I am a preacher of the exemption from sin and that Jesus, when he forgave sin, he did it for, uh, for the entire world, but he did away with sin altogether. And uh, we go into that uh, and have gone into it and gonna be going into it even more on some of the upcoming shows. I can tell I'm probably gonna run over time here. Uh, then I want to point out to you 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. Uh, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. 
And this is where that we begin to embrace this understanding that we've not been imputed with righteousness. We've been made that way. We, you, you don't have wisdom. You are wisdom. You are righteousness. Uh, you are um, uh, sanctification itself and redemption. These, wow, <laughs> that was a big mouthful. I just twiddled over it like it was nothing. Uh, you've been made these things, folks. Goodness gracious, if that doesn't put this kind of smile on your face, nothing will. You've been made these things. These are not possessions. These aren't things we've been given to be the caretakers of and to protect and all of that. You have become these things. So uh, that's why you've been made exempt from sin because you have not been given righteousness You've not been imputed with righteousness because you see, if uh, the issue would have been Jesus imputing his righteousness, giving us his righteousness, that doesn't mean you're a new creature. You're just the same old man with something added. You are not the same old man as Adam with something added. Mm -mm, you're not. You are a brand new creation. And everybody from the Christian world to the mystic world, they have no clue as to why that, that is even there or that it's important. And uh, why people would wanna take away such a powerful understanding of the very meaning of the work of the cross, I don't know. But uh, you know what we teach here and we encourage you to listen to others, listen to them. Uh, we've never got on here and, and uh, told you who teaches bad stuff and don't listen to them. We tell you who teaches bad stuff and please go listen to them because you need to be able to compare that. And uh, because we think you can think for yourself. Why do we think you can think for yourself? Because we know you have been made the wisdom of God himself. This stuff fits with you. This, uh, this stuff, my goodness, I sh should come up with a better vocabulary than that. Uh, but uh, this incredible gospel of peace and grace fits, and you know it fits. And you know it, and you understand it, and it is logical, it's reasonable, it's rational even. Uh, it's not something that you have to leave logic and reason and rationality outside the door to accept some mystical leap of faith. This isn't a leap of faith. This isn't mystical. This is who we are. In fact, it's who everyone is. The fact is also, man, I know a lot of facts. Uh, the fact also is that until you were able to embrace that everybody had this righteousness, you were not able to conceive that you were this righteousness until you were able to see that everybody was the righteousness of God. Now, uh, see, your, your, your whole brain, your soul, because of the work of the cross is now designed to fit this new matrix. We've been using that term a lot. And uh, so when you hear this, that's why this fits is because it's functional it's functional in life. If you ever hear something uh, that is supposed to be truth and it's not functional, what are you doing playing around with something that's not functional, that's not dynamic? The gospel is dynamic. It is at work right now, even as we are speaking. It's at work in me and in you. And it's at work in, in everyone who's hearing it. Uh, it is not at work in those who are not hearing it. This is not a uh, osmosis thing. You really need to hear and understand the truth of the gospel. Now, knowing it and not knowing it doesn't mean you don't have the reality that the gospel teaches and preaches to every human being on the planet. You have it. it uh, everybody has, everybody is it. You don't just have it, you, you is it. <laughs> I've got to work on vocabulary. Uh, but uh, these are the things that uh, we are uh, very convinced of here at the Gospel Revolution. Uh, then another verse that we uh, know of very well is 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God. 
Now, when I was looking at this, I was surprised because the word made for him is different than the word made for us. And I saw that and it's like, what in the world? So you see, when these terms are used, it means that there's something different. Why is the word made for uh, Jesus being made sin and the word for us being made righteousness and the word made is uh, genome. It means creation. It means the the beginning of something that is uh, that is eternal. Genome is the beginning of something that is eternal. And the word for made uh, that Jesus was himself was made sin is the word poeto. And uh, that word, uh, interesting enough, uh, if you look into it, it is, it indeed is like something that's, it's like a yoke. It's something bound to something. So all of this time when I was saying Jesus was made sin, I've got to rethink all this. This, this is hot off the press, folks. Uh, this, I'm having to look at this differently in the fact that the term Jesus was made sin is not the same term as that we were made righteous. The term made righteous is the word genome. And we went into that one to, at nauseum for uh, many of you. And we found out what a wonderful thing that this, this word represents. Uh, and uh, this word uh, is uh, in the Greek uh, that he was made sin. Uh, the, one of the words is, is the word yield. Um, uh, to tarry, to take time. It's not, it's not an eternal word at all. And it's something that is, uh, you get the picture that's something that gets bound to something uh, inexorably. And then the picture that you get is that when Jesus died, that's when sin glommed on to the wrong thing. <laughs> For had the princes of this world known this secret, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Wow. All right. So we've taken you through those uh, few little verses. We're already up to 17 minutes. And I'm going to ask you to go with me just before we close out here, because then you've got to do your homework. And I want you to see where we need to do this. And we I need your help. I want you guys to help me rewrite Thesis 42, 59, 62, and 63. I, I'm really, I really need your help. I'm wanting to hear from you. So uh, thesis number 42 says, Christ's perfection at the resurrection was imputed to all mankind by God's choice. Uh, far from individuals making a decision for Christ, God made a decision for every, each and every person. Now, that's very powerful, but you notice that the term is in there incorrectly from what we have learned is the word imputed. So rewrite that one. We need it rewritten. It's going to be changed, and I want you to be a part of this process. Number 59 says... The new uh, position required and produced a new heart for the whole of humanity. This new heart was given to all and it was imputed with wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. The heart has and knows this intuitively whether one's mind and soul does or not. Yes, that intuitiveness. That's why this this causes you to just, it, it does something to you when you hear it. And uh, that was number 62. Let us go to the last one here in verse, uh, verse um, into thesis number 63. Uh, we also no longer seek his righteousness. It was freely and generously imputed to all. The gospel announcement is the assurance of righteousness. So again, uh, uh, righteousness being imputed would only be the old man getting something new. It's not the old man getting something new. 
It's the new becoming something brand new. What is that? We've become, we've been made righteousness, sanctification, wisdom, and redemption. We've been made that. That is the genome of all of this. And when Jesus was made sin, that means that it was strapped to his back like a yoke. And he took it to his death. And that's where sin died because sin is a parasite. And sin had, had stuck itself onto man and it had a place to live. And then it, when everybody died, that it just glommed on to every brand newborn that was here. But sin made a mistake. Sin thought it could kill Jesus, but it didn't think far enough. Sin did nail Jesus to the cross. And it also destroyed the sin. And Jesus rose from the dead and made all righteous and holy. Forgiveness no longer necessary.